like to call to order for the organization of the 2013-2014 Council. Uh, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I say your name. I am have been elected to the office of mayor. Have been elected to the office of mayor. Of the city of Lake Forest. Of the city of Lake Forest. In the county of Lake. In the county of Lake. In the state of Illinois. We swear <coughs> that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and that I will discharge the duties of said office according to the best of my ability. Can I now have the four aldermen please come forward? Oop, three, we're missing one tonight. <clears throat> Honorable Mayor Shaw. Here. Alderman Lippitt. Here. Alderman Waldeck. Here. Alderman Moore. Here. Alderman Pandaleon is absent. Alderman Tack. Here. Alderman Reisenberg. Here. Alderman Palmer. Here. Alderman Edelman. Here. Mr. Acting Mayor, you have a quorum. Mr. Mayor. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I'm so I sorry. I hope I'm not <laughs> acting anymore. So. <laughs> Thank you, Pity. Would you join me with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I want to uh, say the first uh, item on the agenda this evening is uh, comments by Mayor, and I just want to <clears throat> quickly uh, recognize a couple of folks that are with us tonight. Uh, we have a couple of former mayors, former Mayor Waldeck and Mayor Swartout, who are in the back. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. And thank you for all that you've done for our community. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, first item on the agenda is the election, or I'm sorry, the appointment of uh, city officers, uh, election by the city council is required by the charter and the city code. They are the city treasurer, Elizabeth Holub, city supervisor, Robert Kiley Jr., city attorney, Victor Filippini, city clerk, Robert Kiley Jr., 
and City Surveyor and Engineer Gewalt Hamilton Associates. I need a motion to approve the election as by the City Council as required by Charter and Code of those individuals. So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is appointment of new 2012-2013 board and commission appointments and reappointments. And I've got quite a few, so if you'll bear with me, we'll tick these off. Uh, on building review board, Ross Freeman is appointed. Ted Notes, appointed. Bob Rita, appointed. Charlie King, appointed as chairman. And Michael Black, reappointed to the building review board. Cemetery Commission, Patrick Luby is appointed for term, Dennis O'Brien, and reappointed as chairman is Colin Sylvester. For Croya, Rebecca Quackenbush, Susan uh, Bishless, Elena Hender, Jim Thiel, all of those are reappointments, Jack Williams, Martha Stride, and Annie Cox, uh, Colts. I apologize if I didn't say that one right. Those are all appointments, and all three of those last are student appointments to Croya. Police and Fire Board, Steve Kernahan has been appointed. He's from Ward 2. Historic Preservation Commission, uh, Robert Alfie is an appointment, and Susan Athenson is a reappointment. Legal Committee, Ken Weinberger is an appointment, and Ray Bushman is reappointed as chairman. The Library Board, Kate Bryant is an appointment, and Carol Champ is a reappointment. Park and Recreation Board, Charles Kohlmeyer is an appointment, and Kirk Volkman is reappointed uh, as chairman. Plan Commission, Guy Berg is an appointment, James Karras a reappointment, and Lloyd Culbertson a reappointment. And the ZBA Zoning Board of Appeals, Richard Plonsker is an appointment, and Robert Frankson is appointed as chairman. Uh, all those uh, volunteer profiles should be in your packet. And I believe we need a recommendation uh, for approval of those appointments. And move to approve the recommendations. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, unanimously approved. Uh, there was an item on the agenda, item B, Cool Cities Environmental Leadership, that will be rescheduled for the first meeting of June. And I would just like to take the opportunity to congratulate the aldermen who were also elected or re-elected. Look forward to working with you again for the next two years. Uh, next item on the agenda, comments by City Manager. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. There's one item under my report this evening. I'm going to ask Deshea Kalmar, Director of Human Resources, to come up and talk about the new uh, contract with our uh, firefighters covered by the IFF. Deshea? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, I am very pleased to bring this forward to you this evening. Uh, it was reviewed by the PCA committee this morning and unanimously recommended for approval to you. Uh, just a very brief background in case you're not familiar with public sector labor law in Illinois, um, but under the Illinois laws, uh, uh, public safety officers are not allowed to strike. Therefore, any... Um, time we reach impasse on uh, establishing a contract, it must go to interest arbitration. And we really lose a lot of control when it goes to interest arb because they don't necessarily end up where we would like them to end up. Um, they either choose the union's offer or our offer. They can't compromise. So um, it's best if we can work these things through together. And um, I'm very pleased to uh, report that this year, we were able to reach agreement on a contract uh, without using any attorneys other than for final review of the contract. Um, and it went fairly quickly. Uh, I have in your packet were the uh, essential uh, economic elements of the contract. Uh, first of all, it is a three-year contract and will expire on April 30th, 2016. Um, the pay increases, there are three categories covered under this contract. There are firefighters who are really probationary. They are required to become paramedics by the time they get off of probation. So we have the, uh, a short little range for firefighters. Then we have our firefighter paramedics covered. And finally, our lieutenant paramedics are also covered by this agreement. 
um, for this fiscal year 2014. Uh, the firefighter range is a 0% increase. It is frozen. We don't currently have anyone in that range right now. Um, then for uh, the succeeding years, we have 2% increases during those years. For firefighter paramedic in 2014, steps 1 and 2, there are 7 steps in their range. Steps 1 and 2 are a 0% increase. Steps 3 through 7 are 2.5% increase. If you'll recall, uh, you did approve a 2.5 general range adjustment for the non-organized employees of the city earlier this year. And then uh, for FY15, it's a 2.5% increase. And FY16, uh, steps 1 through 6, uh, it was a 2.5% increase. And then step 7 is a 3% increase. And then finally, with fire lieutenant paramedic, step 1 is a 0% increase. Steps 2 through 6, 2% this first year. Then uh, in 15, 2% increase, and then in FY16, 2.25% increase for the lieutenants. On longevity, basically they agreed to status quo for what our um, current year is and what it was previously. After that, in FY14, goes up $5 at each level of service. And then at uh, FY15, I'm sorry, FY16, it goes up just in the last 20 years or more uh, of the other levels stay the same as they were in FY15. And then finally, holiday compensation. Um, the way we do holiday compensation here in the city is it is a set stipend amount. It's like a holiday bonus, we call it. Many places, they'll get time and a half or whatever for working on a holiday. Here we don't do it that way. We have just the, the set bonus amount. Uh, for FY14, they did agree to keep it at status quo, um, which is $140 when they work a holiday. And then in FY15, it will go up to $190, and in FY16, to $200. Um, the reasoning is that they do, are there for a full 24-hour period, whereas other places, um, like the police department where they work holidays also, they do have three different shifts that are getting that holiday bonus. This way, um, we're getting them a little extra for being there for that uh, 24 hours. Um, also, if someone is called back, sort of forced back on a holiday, meaning they aren't scheduled but they, they can't get anybody to come in, um, they have to force them back. The first shift, they do those in shifts, and it's either eight-hour shifts for firefighters, paramedics, or 12-hour shifts for the um, lieutenants. And the first shift would receive $140. The second and third shifts, if it's filled, if they do bring someone back for those shifts, would receive $25 in a holiday bonus. Uh, health insurance, they uh, agree to status quo of what we do uh, for all of our other employees on the health insurance. The only caveat that they put in there is that they would like to see no more than 10% increases in their premiums for the duration of the contract. Uh, we've been very fortunate with our health insurance premiums. We've been much lower than health insurance trends. So I feel that this is a very doable number to reach. And as I mentioned before, the PCA heard this this morning and unanimous, unanimously recommended uh, approval to the council. Any questions? No, we reviewed it this morning. It's it's truly a, a great pack, a fair pack for all involved, and I think it's a win-win. And I recommend to council that we do approve this. I, I have a couple questions. Yes. What's longevity pay? Uh, it's for how long you've been here working. It recognizes employees who've been here five years or longer. Um, it's paid as a lump sum bonus early December. So that's the they receive that amount. So if it was the, let's say it was fifty dollars, and they had twenty years, they would get essentially a thousand dollars at the end of the year, Correct. every year for the term of the contract. Correct. Okay. Second yeah. question, mm -hmm. and, and last question: Any significant language changes that would affect terms and conditions? 
Not really significant. We did spend a lot of time clarifying language because, you know, we just recently got our first contract with them. It took us a long time to get there. And as they've started working through it, they found little things where both sides were going, well, what does this really mean? You know, so we spent some time clarifying. We spent some time cleaning up the language to coincide with what they actually were doing during the, the term of the last contract. So there was something like that, but it, nothing that's really significant. Nothing that would changes. affect productivity or anything like no. that? No. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. That's it. Any other comments or questions for Deshay? If not, I'd like a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call vote, please, Biddy. Alderman Novit. Uh, aye. Alderman Waldeck. <coughs> aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Seven yay, zero nay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deshay, for all of your good efforts there. Next item on the agenda, comments by council members. The first item under here this evening will be consideration of a recommendation from the city's housing trust fund board recommending approval of a resolution in support of a long-term plan for the senior cottages, authorizing the release of a reversion clause for the property, and authorizing the acknowledgement of full satisfaction of the obligations of Presbyterian Homes special use permit. Uh, Kathy Cerniak, and I think I'd like to also invite former Alderman Tom Morsch. Okay. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Congratulations to everybody, and it's nice to be back here. Nice to be over here instead of over there. So, um, as uh, the mayor indicated, this uh, resolution that will facilitate the transfer of the senior cottages uh, to Community Partners for Affordable Housing, which is a non-for-profit organization that has been involved with the city on other affordable pro uh, housing projects. Um, importantly, what it does is it stabilizes, for those of you that have been around for a while and I believe have been briefed on this, it stabilizes the city cottages, the senior cottages for the long term. Um, when they were built, they were built with a mortgage, and the mortgage was um, a large percentage of the overall cost of the project. It therefore made it difficult without subsidies <clears throat> to keep the cottages affordable and also at the same time provide monies for upkeep and maintenance of the cottages. Um, so over the years, they've been very much kind of struggling. Uh, what this solution does is engages um, uh, another non-for-profit entity, uh, which the cottages would be transferred for uh, to, and we are leveraging a grant from the Illinois Housing Development Authority, effectively mm -hmm. tax credits, uh, which uh, provide an imp influx of a half million dollars, uh, which will be used to pay down the mortgage, establish a reserve fund, and keep the cottages affordable uh, for the future. So um, we're here tonight to ask your approval of both um, uh, a release of a reversion clause. And what that is is in the original contract for the senior cottages, there was a reversion clause that stated that if the cottages were not senior, being used for senior cottages, that the ownership would revert from the Senior Cottage Foundation back to the city. And in this case, we're asking release of that, and that is designed that if there are not seniors available for the cottages, which have priority under the ordinances of the city, that an affordable uh, family or individual that would qualify would be able to rent the units so that they maintain their cash flow going forward. So that's uh, the purpose today. I would like to, uh, the Housing uh, Trust Board met and unanimously approved this transfer. Um, without the hard work of people like Tom Tropp, who have been shepherding this project from the beginning, uh, from the day that they were built, and Tom is here today, and I'd like to really acknowledge him as the real leader of the senior cottages, um, uh, this would not be happening. I'd also like to acknowledge 
uh, Alderman Moore, who's been uh, very helpful as a member of the Housing Trust, and uh, all the people that have contributed, like Forest Bank and Trust, um, and Kathy and Bob, of course, have been uh, looking at this as a very, uh, you know, a project we need to solve this problem for many years. So we're happy to bring uh, a solution here to you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have, or Kathy, if I forgot something, please jump in with me. <laughs> questions for Tom? Mike? Yeah, um, I just want to echo your comments about Tom Trapp. He's, his personal contributions and commitment to this endeavor have been enduring and enabled us to get to this point, so the council recognizes and acknowledges that. Other questions, comments? Uh, Tom, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your great leadership, not only on the Housing Trust, but uh, in this particular situation. It was complicated, to say the least, and you did a wonderful job in pulling all the players together and making it all happen and bringing a resolution that I think is a very positive one. Great. So thank you so much for all of your efforts. And, Tom, echoing what Mike said, thank you for all of your efforts as well. Would this be two motions or just one? It could be a single motion. The resolution before you covers both of these issues. Okay. And then I'd move to uh, waive the city's right of first refusal and then to approve the authorization, uh, well, I, I, approving the transfer of the senior cottages. That's Second. Fourth in the resolution right now. Second. Uh, roll call vote, please, Benny. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Seven yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Next item on the agenda, approval of a resolution declaring Wedgwood Lots number 22, 23, 24, a surplus, and approving a 50-foot covenant on parcels 23 and 24, pre presented by Victor Filippini, City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, as you've discussed in the past, the City did receive, as, um, as a gift, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, the three lots in question, which are at the far southwest corner of the city, right north of the village of Bannockburn boundary and more or less uh, adjacent to the tollway. Um, the council has the ability at this time to dispose of these properties if it so chooses. I, I know that the PPNL committee has in fact reviewed this and determined that these are parcels that uh, would be best served to have them uh, removed from the city's um, inventory of land and the resolution before you tonight would accomplish that. There's actually a number of different steps involved. One is first, this resolution would be declaring those parcels as surplus, which means that the city no longer has a need for them. Two, it would be establishing a means for the disposition of those properties, and I'll get into that in just a minute. And three, it will be imposing covenants on two of the lots to ensure that the uh, the south 50 feet of those lots are going to be uh, maintained as uh, w without any kind of uh, construction and that the that they will have uh, the existing tree cover maintained which has provided uh, both a visual and sound buffer from the uh, the uh, warehouse property to the south the procedure for selling it uh, is set out in the resolution and it's really two things one the uh, city has received a number of inquiries over uh, the, the past number of years for, uh, uh, from, I should say, uh, developers uh, who have expressed some interest in the property. The resolution would provide city staff with the first opportunity to reach out to them, see if any of them were interested in purchasing it, and if we have offers, bring those offers back to the city council. Um, if we don't have uh, any response from that, it would authorize the city manager to um, retain a real, a real estate broker to market the properties on behalf of the city. The commission for the broker is, is set forth in the resolution. I would note that we have appraisals, and the appraised value would be what is presented uh, for the sale of the property. Um, the, the one thing that I would note, everything would have to come back to the council for final approval unless the city manager receives um, 
bids for the property at or above the appraised price. In that case, we do provide uh, to allow the city manager simply to accept those bids uh, since they are meeting the, the threshold that the council will have accepted. Um, so the resolution tonight before you will allow that whole process to get started and lead <coughs> to the, one would hope, ultimate disposition of these properties uh, and bring them back both on the tax roll and make them available for development. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I have one question. <coughs> Is there any way to determine uh, what the increased encumbrance with the setback did to the market value of the properties? I, I think probably the the best bet is going to be to see what happens, if anything, to the um, you know on, on the marketing attempts. I, I would note that the setback area in question, uh, the preservation area, more or less corresponds to the setback. I'm going to, is it exactly? Yeah, it's exactly. That's what I meant. Uh, <laughs> it's exactly the same as our as our uh, setback requirement in any event. So the, the real notion there was to make sure that there wasn't, if in the future, some change in the regulations, going to be a diminution of that, uh, of that protective buffer area that's been in place. And so ZBA would be informed of this and more than likely not grant a variance then? Uh, the if the ZBA wouldn't have the ability to grant the variance. The council would have to do that in this instance because it's a property right of the city in this instance. If it the, were the sold covenant. and a new owner came to The ZBA. new owner would actually have to ask, petition the city okay. itself, and the city council would make that call. And it matches the existing. Okay, just wanted to. Correct. And I think it's arguable that it adds value as opposed to diminished value. You could go both, either way on that one. Any other questions for Vic? <laughs> If not, we need a motion to approve the resolution declaring Wedgwood Lots 22, 23, 24 surplus and approving a 50-foot covenant on parcels 23 and 24. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, roll call vote, please, Betty. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Seven yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Betty. Next item on the agenda, approval of a resolution relating to the city's right of first refusal for the property known as the YMCA building in Market Square, going back to Vic Philippine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. It's a little bit of a risk putting that in front of me like that, but um, I will simply address the issue and not uh, offer any song to go along. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Too. Nor, nor will I do any semaphore. Um, <laughs> as far as the, uh, the property in question, um, this is the, uh, the, the building at the, um, just, it's where the, the, the jewelry store is. I, 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 um, as the city had one time owned this property, at the time that it sold, it did impose a uh, right of first refusal in the event the property was ever sold by the then current owner. Um, the city has been, uh, provided with notice that the property has been put up for sale. Um, and uh, the PPNL committee did consider this. The recommendation was to, um, to waive the right of first refusal with respect to the current notice. Uh, I would note that there was uh, in your packet um, one oversight, and it should be added to the language before you. If you look on page uh, 90, of the packet section two there should be an insertion to, to state that the uh, city would not recognize or would not exercise its reacquisition rights under the deed pursuant to the notice and offer with respect to the subject property um, so we're not making this as a blanket waiver for any any such right it's only with respect to the current notice and offer um, with that I would uh, present to the council the resolution and ask for your favorable consideration Questions of Vic on this? Hearing none, I'd like a motion to approve the resolution related to the city's right of first refusal on the YMCA building in Market Square. So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Uh, again, roll call vote, please, Biddy. Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Seven yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is consideration of a resolution directing the plan commission to review and reconsider 
previously accepted development parameters for the city's 10-acre Laurel Avenue and Western Avenue property and pending approval of a resolution. Kathy Cerniak, Director of Community Development. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. After the last one, I'm tempted to defer this to the chairman of the PPL, but I will make a brief presentation. Um, this res this uh, resolution is included in your packet on page 98. It does come to you as a recommendation from the Property and Public Land Subcommittee of the City Council. Uh, the PPNL has been discussing the Laurel Avenue property uh, for uh, a number of months now, and their recommendation is that it is an appropriate time for the Plan Commission to be directed to reconsider the development parameters that were previously approved for that property in July of 2008. Those parameters were developed after a, uh, a number of community sessions that were held by the Laurel Avenue Redevelopment Committee that was appointed by then Mayor Rummel. Um, the PPNL reviewed those parameters and there's a matrix included in your packet that identifies some parameters that are appropriate for reconsideration. Uh, the PPNL didn't direct that changes be made, but simply given uh, the fact that a number of years have passed, economic uh, conditions are different and uh, different activity has taken place in the community. Uh, the resolution directs that the plan commission begin immediately to undertake this reconsideration and to uh, prepare a, a recommendation for the city council on or about September 1st of this year. If you choose to do so, it would be appropriate to approve the resolution. Questions of Kathy? Yeah, I mean, I, without uh, going beyond, I mean, obviously the economics involved uh, with development right now have changed radically, but are we addressing the economic realities of what can be constructed or what the caretaker is moving forward as a community of how we'd like this to be developed? I'm not sure what the initial, the reason is for the change at this point in time, and there has to be an apparent one. Are we looking to widen uh, some of the potential density uh, issues in the property, just open ideas? Where are we going? I'll make a few comments, but then I will uh, turn it over to the members of the PPL. Uh, this committee has met with a consultant that the council engaged uh, a number of times and has um, explored different opportunities. There have been some very preliminary conversations with, in general, with developers who, who may or may not be interested in the property. My sense is the PPNL simply wanted the discussion to begin. They didn't direct that any changes be made. But just because it's been a number of years, just uh, felt that it was important to step back, relook at the property, and reconsider the parameters without any specific direction, really allowing the plan commission to do its job and hear public testimony. Okay. Just simply, it's to revisit it conceptually, to be open-minded. These are different times. We really want to set it up so someone can hit it out of the ballpark in theory so we we want to just be as diligent as possible and considering every possible uh, permutation and combination that's all yeah there's no. nothing sophisticated in that. and I appreciate it I hope that someone can knock it out of the ballpark and buy it pretty quickly but again I just want to make sure that in hitting the home run that we kind of achieve you know for the next 50 years what we want to see as a community and not just uh, kind of throw the fat pitch Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, we will not relinquish any of our guiding principles. Yeah. That's uh, okay. Uh, I need a motion to approve the resolution. And I'll move to approve the resolution. Second. Second. Uh, Biddy, roll call vote, please. Alderman mm. Novit? Aye. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Seven yay, zero nay, motion carries. Thank you very much, Biddy. Next item on the agenda is opportunity for citizens to address the City Council on nine agenda items. Anyone out there? Don't see anyone. We'll move on to items for omnibus vote consideration. We have five this evening, and I'll read those, and then we'll... <clears throat> you're welcome to take any one of those individually if you see fit, or if not, we'll... 
uh, vote and hopefully approve all of those together. Item number one, approval of the May 6, 2013 regular City Council minutes. Item number two, award of purchase for the replacement of a one-ton four-wheel drive pickup truck for the forestry section included in the FY 2014 capital equipment budget. Number three, award of purchase for the replacement of a half-ton extended cab pickup for the parks section included in the FY 2014 capital equipment budget. Number four, award of purchase for the replacement of a one-ton four-wheel drive pickup truck for the water and sewer section included in the FY 2014 capital equipment budget. And number five, consideration of ordinances approving recommendations from the Building Review Board, first reading and if so desired by the Council, final approval. Anyone want to take any of those individually? If not, I'd look for a motion to approve those as a group. So moved. Second. Uh, Biddy, roll call, please. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Seven yay, zero nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda this evening is ordinances. And the first item is consideration of an ordinance amending the City of Lake Forest Liquor Code for final approval pre presented by Vic Filippi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, in your packet, you did receive a black line version which showed changes to the version that you had last previously considered. Um, in terms of the changes that were shown in that draft, I think they can be summarized in four uh, generic terms. Uh, two of them were uh, a sets of changes that appeared throughout the ordinance. One related to fees for liquor licenses. We've moved that from the ordinance, or I'm sorry, from the city code chapter four to a separate fee schedule. Two is that we've made a number of changes that were technical in nature to address limited liability companies as one of the types of entities that would be um, applying for and receiving liquor licenses. Uh, they had not been previously identified in uh, earlier uh, versions of this ordinance nor in the current city code. I will note that those are relatively recent um, legally recognized entities and our code is not that recent. So um, we're, we're just sort of catching up with the time. The other two changes uh, both appear in section 4-7 relating to the authority of the local liquor commissioner, one of which allows the liquor commissioner to waive the annual fingerprinting requirement for any of the required uh, applicants um, so long as they have at least obtained fingerprints in one uh, prior application. It's something more as a matter of convenience. It was something that was raised with members of the community, uh, of the liquor license holders in the community because some of them, uh, for example, Walgreens have uh, directors who have to report, um, but they are not necessarily in the area and uh, the inconvenience of having them come in to get their fingerprints was, was seen as something that we might want to relax for them. Um, the other has to do with the uh, local liquor commissioner's ability to extend the term of a liquor license for administrative convenience that might come up. Uh, a good example might be if we have a liquor code amendment that uh, is considered over several council meetings if that ever were to happen. Um, so that, that, that allows us to make sure that people don't have an expiring license in that instance. Um, there are three other issues that uh, are not reflected in the draft that's part of the packet that um, you may watch, uh, want to give some consideration to, one of which uh, is uh, something that you've previously discussed and that relates to the gas stations as it's currently drafted and what's in your packet, gas stations as is an, under the current code are not entitled to apply for or receive a liquor license. Uh, that's on page 15 of, of the draft ordinance, section 4-14. Um, there's another section uh, in the ordinance, section 4-1722, that relates to um, the state liquor code requirement prohibiting uh, aldermen from being uh, part of a liquor license application. Note that to be part of a liquor license application, it's not nearly uh, the owner of the business. It may also be, for example, with a, a private club board members. Uh, they are required to be part of that application. There is a provision in the state code which allows us to modify the requirement with respect to aldermen so long as they are not 
um, law enforcement officers. Um, that's something that uh, if the council wishes to change this, this provision so that aldermen can, in fact, be members of a club board of directors, for example, um, they could do so so long as they are not law enforcement officers, and, and we will clarify that in the city code as well. Um, you all may uh, have received at some point in the past badges. Um, the badges will now become token as opposed to uh, real. Uh, uh, the, the last change has to do with um, also with clubs, and that section... Um, sorry, I'm losing my, my train here. Uh, <laughs> It has to do with the uh, the club licenses section or class D1. Uh, we had previously allowed them to uh, have both off, well, currently they are only allowed to have on premises sales, um, on premises consumption. Uh, we did learn again in our uh, outreach to the liquor license holders at a number of the clubs do have occasional opportunities for wine tastings and the like where members of the club could actually purchase uh, alcoholic liquor for off-premises consumption. Otherwise, they could buy it at the club but then bring it home. Um, in the draft before you that was in the packet, there was no limitation on that. On further communications with uh, some of those clubs that do have such a um, such types of events, we learn that they are typically no more than four times a year. So there is a recommendation that the limitation be imposed for four times a year, and that would be one other change that would be made. So there there are the changes that are in the black line that were in your packet. There are the, uh, the three other matters for your consideration, one regarding uh, aldermen being able to, to sit on a board of directors of, say, a club, one involving the uh, off-premises consumption uh, limitation on clubs, and then the third, wherever you all want to go with it, regarding the golf course, or, I'm sorry, the gas stations. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Well, I'd just like to make a statement. The, the gas station topic has come up before, and we've gone one way or the other. Uh, if it is in there, I will vote against this ordinance because I think yeah, it's too. the prerogative of the liquor commissioner to decide who gets a liquor license. I don't know why we would arbitrarily uh, vote against, I mean, prohibit a gas station from having one because if you go to get liquor at Walgreens or Jewel, you are driving. Um, I think we've kind of over overanalyzed it. So I don't think that should be in. That doesn't mean that a gas station can get a liquor license, but it'll be up to the liquor commissioner to make the decision. Well, and I feel, and this will come as no surprise <laughs> to anyone, I don't think, I feel just as strongly that um, the code should, re should remain as is prohibiting gas stations from selling liquor. Um, I think that um, the focus, I, I think we've become too focused on, well, what's fair for these individual gas station owners? And and the question seems to have become, well, if Walgreens can sell liquor and CVS can sell liquor and Jewel can sell liquor, then why not the gas station owner too? And, and in, in my mind, you know, I'm all for promoting local business and I'm all for helping local businessmen do as well as they can financially and, and make as much money as they can financially. But I don't think that's the proper focus. I think the focus has to be on what's best for the community. And this is an issue that I really believe goes to the heart of, of, of the character and the, uh, the, the, the integrity of our community. And a gas station is a very, very different business from a grocery store. And it's a very different business from a Walgreens or a drugstore or a CVS. You don't pull in front of the Jewel and leave your car running uh, and run in there and grab your six pack of beer and, and come out. Um, I think that there are many, in fact, the majority of our surrounding communities have these prohibitions against selling liquor at gas stations, and there's a reason for it, and this is the reason. So I'm in favor of leaving the code as is and continuing that prohibition. 
for me personally, I don't like arbitrary exclusions, and this is nothing but an arbitrary exclusion. Um, it assumes that the ownership of the gas stations are necessarily somehow less responsible than other businesses, and I don't think that's uh, necessarily true. And this doesn't grant anybody the privilege of a liquor license, as it was mentioned. This still remains the decision of the commissioner. So I think that with this present, I couldn't vote for it. The kind of a uh, procedural question, given what you said earlier about Alderman being on a board or commission that of an entity that receives a liquor license, where does, where does that leave Alderman Reisenberg this evening? I, I believe that. Well, let, let me answer that in two parts. First, if you would, if you agree to consider this with the change that um, that I had identified, allowing um, Alderman to sit on that board, then he would not be able to vote on an, on this at all. If you decide to move forward without the change that I discussed, then that would require uh, Alderman Reisenberg to make the Hobson's choice of stepping down from either the council or the board. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I know Alderman Waldeck is passionate in her feelings about it, but I, I have to agree with, um, with the position. I think it's, it's, it's arbitrarily exclusionary. The Liquor Commission has the ability to decide who is fit to sell alcohol and, and, and who isn't, and why are we singling out a gas station. Moreover, you can travel to gas stations throughout the entirety of Lake County, and I suspect most of them do sell alcoholic beverages. So we're kind of the exception to the rule if we were to restrict gas stations. I actually think we got a list and that the majority, the vast majority of the communities don't sell liquor from the gas station from from gas stations. Um, I think that um, gas stations in unincorporated Lake County do. I don't know if you're familiar with the gas stations on the corner of um, 176 and Waukegan, um, but on one corner there's a gas station that's in unincorporated Lake County, I believe, or pre perhaps <coughs> it's in Knollwood, and that is actually situated, I think it's next to a liquor store, and both the liquor store and the gas station sell liquor, um, and yet the gas station across the street, on the other side of the street, which is in, I believe, in Lake Bluff, does not. Well, don't you so see an, an, an inequity in that? You know, no, I don't. I, I, I think that Lake Bluff, um, and again, I believe that we asked Chief Hell to, pr to provide us with a list, and I don't have it in front of me, but my recollection was that the vast majority of North Shore communities, Lake Bluff, Libertyville, Highland Park, uh, Kenilworth, Wilmette, Winnetka, Deerfield, um, Glenview, do not sell liquor out of gas stations. And again, um, and I think the reasoning is this, is that there's something very unique about a gas station. You get there in a car. You leave in a car. And alcohol and cars are not a good combination. But, Kathy, that's and true when you purchase your liquor at Costco, at Walgreens, I understand. at CVS, at I Denny's, and so I understand, so but, 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 but you're not going to Costco pulling up there, grabbing your 20-ounce or your 40-ounce bottle of beer and driving away. You aren't. And you, you can't compare Costco or Jewel to a gas station. And, and I understand that it's hard for gas stations to survive now. And I understand that many of them I mean, gas at Costco is cheaper, right? That's probably why you go there to, to buy your gas. I go there um, to buy my wine. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> right, right. But, but and, I, and, I, and I understand that. And, and that's why, you know, um, gas stations have become, you know, gas stations slash convenience stores. But I don't want to see our gas stations turn into gas stations slash liquor stores. I think that this will turn what used to be a gas station into primarily a stop-and-go liquor store. And um, I don't I don't like that. And I and I don't and I do think it adversely affects who we are. And 
our, I, I don't think it's arbitrary. I don't think that any gas station in our community should be allowed to sell liquor. I'm not saying that we allow one to do it and not the other. And I promise you, once we allow one to do it, 30 seconds later, uh, we'll get a request from remaining gas stations to do the same thing. So we better be prepared to allow it across the board if we're going to allow it at all. Well, I, I think we can watch if there's a problem. That's the whole idea of having a liquor commissioner, that if it turns out there is a problem, either people drinking or driving or whatever. Now, as far as people running up to the jewel, leaving their cars running and going in to get a six pack, I think people in this room once in a while may have done it. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, as written, if Costco had been in Lake Forest, Costco would have been prohibited from selling liquor because it has a gas operation. I don't think, again, I think it's really arbitrary and doesn't make any sense. I'd like to address the issue of badges. First off, I don't have one. <laughs> and um, we probably don't need no stinking badges. Um, so I think that we ought to look at uh, taking away that uh, law enforcement officer thing. I don't know that any alderman has ever really utilized that. I mean, I would I like... I, I, so I, I want people <clears throat> driving with their cell phones that I could arrest if I had a badge, but I never got a badge. You'll, you'll get I keep mine ready to use, just waiting for that moment. But I, I think it does serve a purpose to have a law enforcement ability. So, and, and I don't think it really interferes with anyone's life to say you can't serve on the board of a club that sells liquor. I think there are plenty of people that you can get to serve on a board, and other that you can serve to be as an alderman. So, I, I preserve. I do have my badge. I haven't used it yet, but I. I do believe in its efficacy, and I know of instances where it's been used. As, as to that point, if I might just make a, a note, the, the language that we're suggesting, um, which if, if you were to look at um, page 21 of the, of the markup, would be to say, right now it reads, any law enforcement, or any law enforcing public official, any mayor, alderman, or member of the city council, any chairperson of the county board. We would change this to read, any law enforcement uh, public official, including where applicable aldermen or members of the city council, comma, any mayor, and go on. The, the distinction is that um, under state law right now, except for special charter municipalities, which the city of Lake Forest is one, uh, you're not a law enforcing official as an alderman unless you go through special training through the state uh, police board. And what we would be suggesting would be to apply that. We can do this through our home rule power. We can apply that standard to aldermen. So if an alderman chooses to go through the, the state uh, certification process through the law enforcement or through the uh, police board, then they could do that. At and they should be immediately relieved. I'm sorry? Then they should be immediately relieved. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at his or her option, they could do that. And if they don't, then they wouldn't be precluded from serving on the board of a, uh, of a club or something like that that has a license. So we wouldn't be precluding any alderman from acting in the law enforcement capacity. Um, and we wouldn't be changing the charter aspect that you'll be peace officers. The, the distinction is you'll be a peace officer without law enforcement capabilities. Uh, Vic, even though I'm uh, essentially required to abstain in terms of the voting process, can I? May I speak to the issue? Uh, certainly. Depends okay. Which side of the issue? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not on your side. <laughs> um, I can't leave Kathy out here alone. Um, two things, and uh, you've heard this before uh, from me, is number one: um, mm -hmm. previous council has dealt with this issue. And I don't know how long ago it was, perhaps 10 years ago, they unanimously uh, approved the resolution which did not allow gas stations. S secondly, um, I, I just don't think beer, wine, liquor in gas stations fits the character of Lake Forest, quite, quite frankly. Uh, it just doesn't, it, it, has no, it has no place in Lake Forest, the Lake Forest that I know and love and right now represent. Uh, it has no place for it. So I, I, see, I see no compelling reason to change the ordinance. That's my piece. 
Okay, can I just make a counterpoint? Of course. So what does fit the character of Lake Forest is that we can pull up to Walgreens or CVS, go in and buy our Vicodin, our Valium, and our Prozac, and a bottle of vodka and a six-pack, where it clearly says do not mix alcohol with these drugs. Mike, so, Mike, Mike somehow, <laughs> somehow there is a – Mike, somehow, like one is uh, generally requires a prescription – and, and there's a, there's a large – which I probably can't vocalize, but there's a large distinction in my mind between a, uh, a drugstore, uh, which tends to be well-supervised, and gas stations that tend to be undermanaged. And there's a clear connection between gasoline and alcohol – and to me, they just not only don't they fit the character of Lake Forest, uh, but they don't mix. Not to mention the fact that you can buy any number of things at Walgreens. It's it's six times the size of um, a gas your typical gas station mini mart, um, which is which is very small, very very limited in what it offers, and um, to walk into such a place and to see alcohol displayed you know in, in in a in a case a refrigerated case as soon as you walk in or perhaps right behind the, the counter or to have a sign in the window um cold beer um that's usually what the gas stations that sell liquor have they have signs in the window um um you know cold beer atm lottery tickets um you know we have a gas station um, and the gas station that was sort of the impetus for this whole discussion, which is across the street from this building at the gateway to our business district at the corner of <clears throat> Deer Path and Oakwood. I don't want to drive down that street and see a sign in the window telling me I can buy cold beer there. I don't want to see it at Walgreens either. <laughs> but again, I think that, you know, there's a big, big difference between Walgreens and CVS and the nature of their operations and a gas station and I'm not trying to disparage this gas station or any other gas station um, but but there's there's obvious differences I, I think in the matter of supervision you're prejudging you're 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 going by a stereotype well they're undermanned and that again it's it should be a matter for the liquor commissioner which is to say the mayor uh, to monitor what's happening and quite conceivably could grant a liquor license to this uh, gas station, which the one we're talking about over here is really a convenience mart. Uh, you know, they don't have lube service or other things. They have, you know, convenience things. But you can, the, the mayor is able to say, no, we've seen it in practice and it doesn't work. I don't think it's our job to prejudge. I think the discretion should be given to the liquor commissioner. And I think it's our job to be stewards of this community. And I agree wholeheartedly with Jack's comments that this is not in keeping with Lake Forest. Yeah, I have a, I'd just like to make a comment mm -hmm. if I could. Go ahead. <clears throat> I have a great deal of respect for Alderman Waldeck's position, and I understand where it comes from. It, it, it's more distasteful for me to, to eliminate the possibility of something when there's a vehicle there for approving or, or disapproving. But I, I think the thing that's really grating on me a bit here is the, uh, um, and of course, I was on HPC, which was, you know, its purview was to protect the character of Lake Forest. Uh, but, but disallowing and allowing things based on the character of Lake Forest reminds me of those days when we didn't want Costco and we didn't want McDonald's. And, and, and these seem so ridiculous and archaic now and, and, and at like such ridiculous mistakes, whether it was the lawsuit to keep McDonald's out or Costco. I, I, don't, uh, um, I don't want to be one of the people that limit us on that basis because I think there's a public forum for these things. Uh, that exists. Am I wrong? Is the does the liquor commission have any public testimony or involvement? We actually have a an administrative approach which involves a fairly detailed application 
One of the things that's also in the draft ordinance before you would allow the liquor commissioner to impose conditions on, on uh, any applicant that comes in. Any public review or public involvement? Well, the, the city council actually will have the first cut at any new application um, that does not already have a license because we have a cap on the number of licenses. So, so if you were to come pass to this, this meeting and... Correct. If, if you were to pass this tonight without the exclusion on a on a gas station, there are no available licenses. And if a gas station sought a license, they would have to come to the city council and ask you to create a new license so that they could apply for it. Okay. So it would have a, an opportunity for the council to check in at that level in addition to the application process. You know, here's what I would say. Let's, I'm, I'm sensing we have we may have a majority one way, and I think we ought to take it. Let's see if we can um, find out where we are at this point in time. Um, so I, I would look for a motion to approve the second reading of the ordinance amending the liquor code. If I might suggest that at least with respect to whatever motion comes forward, uh, is the council prepared to accept a motion with both the Class D1 limitation on the number of events for off-premises sales and the aldermanic uh, language about law enforcement officers? And that way, at least how you all go forward with the gas station is up to you all. So that any motion would include those items? If, if that's the general understanding of the council. Could you reread the motion that we would be voting on? Is it, it would allowing be a, or not allowing gas stations to be? Um, that that would be up to whoever wants to make the motion. Right now, it would, uh, if it's as presented with those two changes that I've just identified, then gas stations would not be allowed to petition. There would need to be a third change, and that would be to delete the language on page 15 that currently prohibits gas stations. So that would be up to whoever wants to make the motion. Okay. Can I make the motion to uh, accept the ordinance with the amendment to delete the reference to denying a, a permit to a gas station? Is there a second on that motion? Second. Biddy, roll call vote, please. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Nay. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Abstain. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Motion passes. Aye. Motion passes. Five zero. Motion passes. No, not five zero. This, there was a nay and an abstention. Five, we had five, one nay. Five one. Five, five, five one. one. With an abstention. Oh, I'm sorry. Five, five one. one. My, my apologies. But it one does pass. Yeah. Perhaps we're a bit late, but is there anyone who'd like to make a comment <laughs> on this matter? Andy, would you like to come up? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council Men and Women. Uh, my name is Andy Duran. I'm the Executive Director of LEAD and the Speak Up Prevention Coalition here in Lake Forest, 400 East Illinois Road. I'm coming to you tonight in response to the discussion you've just been having tonight and at uh, previous Council meetings in both March and April regarding the proposed liquor license at the Shell Station on the corner of Deer Path and Oakwood. It is the well-informed opinion of LEAD and Speak Up that the Shell Station should not be allowed to sell liquor in our community. We believe that gas stations should not be allowed to sell liquor, and many surrounding communities, as uh, Councilman Waldeck has said, restrict such sales. But our concern really with the Shell Station is not just because it's a gas station. Rather, we believe it would increase the ease of access that youth in our community have to alcohol, and that seems to be the argument that's missing here. This particular gas station is frequented often by youth walking into town, from both Deer Path Middle School and the School of St. Mary every day after school. If you drive or walk down any, either of these two streets between 3 and 4 p.m., you will literally see hundreds of students. The Shell Station is also located across the street from Subway, which attracts a lot of underage youth to the particular area. <clears throat> Within a three-block radius from the station, liquor sales, including single-use units, are already allowed at Walgreens, CVS, and Lake Forest Food and Wine, not to mention the local restaurant establishments. Granting a liquor license to the Shell Station would make the amount of liquor selling retail establishments in this area very, very dense. We do have an underage drinking problem in Lake Forest. Our students are drinking at rates much higher than most places in the country, according to local data. You can take steps towards helping to level out this issue. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Community Guide to Preventative Services has endorsed reducing outlet density as one of the most effective strategies for reducing alcohol use among young people. Obtaining a liquor license is a privilege, not a right. 
and we hope the council um, decides not to grant a license here uh, and not even needing to identify a specific basis for doing so. Protecting the youth of our community should be our number one concern. We urge you to help us continue to take steps forward, not steps back, by deciding not to grant a liquor license to the Shell Station on the basis of protecting our most precious asset, our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And we have a we have a ordinance that's been approved. Uh, Vic, will you redraft that? How will that work? Uh, we will make a final version with the changes that the council had voted on tonight, and that will be available for signature and, and publication. Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, consideration of a recommendation from the Plan Commission in support of an ordinance amending Chapter 46, <coughs> Section 10E of the City Code as it relates to fences in ravines and on bluffs. And this is presented by Kathy Cerniak, Director of Community Development, for final approval. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. In February of this year, the Council granted first, first reading of an ordinance prohibiting fences in ravines and on bluffs. As part of your deliberations, you identified two issues and asked the, <coughs> remanded the ordinance back to the Plan Commission and asked for further consideration. The Plan Commission heard this item <coughs> and held a public hearing in April, and they considered the two items as you requested. The first item um, raised by one alderman was whether or not an opportunity <coughs> for a variance should be included in the ordinance. The Plan Commission discussed that issue, and their sense was that the variance process works very well. Um, variance requests go before the Zoning Board of Appeals, various criteria are, are considered, um, and there are specific additional criteria with respect to fences included in this ordinance. So the Plan Commission decided that their recommendation would remain that an opportunity for a variance should be provided. The second issue that the Plan Commission considered at your direction was whether or not an amortization period uh, which would require the removal of existing fences within a certain time period should be included in the ordinance. After hearing public testimony and after Plan Commission deliberation, this ordinance comes back to you uh, with a recommendation that the language relating to an amortization period and the language requiring removal of fences prior to the transfer of ownership of property, that both of those provisions be deleted from the ordinance. Uh, the provision that remains, um, and this ordinance begins on page 175 of your packet, the provision that remains is, is that fences, existing fences may remain so long as, in summary, they remain upright, in, in good condition, and they are not found to impede drainage or be a safety hazard. Um, that language is in 5C of the ordinance in your packet, page 176. And just to make sure that um, the proper authority is there, the city attorney is recommending some additional language changes to that section C of the ordinance. So I will ask uh, Mr. Filippini to explain those changes. Uh, just briefly on page 175 of your packet, the language in C, uh, given that this is actually a regulatory action of the council, um, the language should be revised to read provided this is halfway through that section C provided however that such fences may only be allowed to remain upon compliance with the following conditions as determined at the reasonable discretion of the city manager or the manager's designee. Uh, reasonable this is always our standard for regulations so we should reflect that in the ordinance. With that I, I would uh, recommend that the council consider the ordinance uh, with that slight modification. I, have a comment. I, I think I was one of the people who wanted the, the uh, um, how do we phrase it, the uh, amortization. I think there's been a, uh, um, a great deal of, of bisecting and privatization. I think that I didn't grow up here, but my wife did. And, and uh, looking across ravines at your neighbor's yard was your view when their, your yard was their view. And I think there's been a... Um, a great deal of, uh, uh, I don't know, too strong of a word is damaged to that sort of a, that sort of view of Lake Forest, and I think it, I think it kind of, you know, you're you're more or less hurting your neighbors, and it would make it would make sense to me that if we gave the people who put up their fences, just to restate my point on the suggestion, 
some ability to gain some benefit from the money they've invested, but yet, you know, begin to revert those views and those ravines, which is what we're talking about, back to their their natural good looks. I think we're giving up. A, I think we're missing a heck of an opportunity to um, to bring back some of the beauty that's been obstructed with the different styles of fences. I think the way the language reads. Somebody could keep those fences upright as they have in many neighborhoods in, in Lake Forest for 50 years by pounding a new pole in, wiring things together. Upright and not obstructing a flow, I think, lends itself to a, um, a horrible mess down the road. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't really have an agenda as to when that sunset would occur, but I think it's critical that there is some sunset put into the fences that would be in in violation of the new code. We've clearly approved a code that we believe in, an ordinance, excuse me. We, we, we believe it is a, it's a good ordinance as it relates to the setback and the 10%, however, however it was described, I, it, was a, it was a good rule. But to, to say that that rule is a good rule, but it's not a good rule for the next 50 years for the homes that are currently in violation of it, um, I just think denies the possibility to 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 get back to to some of that look that was so nice. Even I've I've noticed it in the short twenty years I've lived here. It's chopped up. I agree. Just... I agree, David, with your with your comments, and um, I um, am in favor of some sort of amortization. I hope I didn't murder that word. Um, period. Um, unless there's a compelling um, legal reason not to do so. I just think that, to echo your concerns, that um, the natural beauty of our ravines is truly unique, and, it, and it's something that really, really makes our community special. And um, to um, that we're really, by constructing or allowing some of these fences to exist for many, many, many years down the road, um, we're, we're damaging that, that and we're really infringing upon the enjoyment of neighboring properties. Um, Especially on ravines, you look across. Right, right. I, I, yeah, I, I, was, I, was on the, I was the chairman of the plan commission when we, when we moved this forward. And one of the reasons we moved this forward, it was really as the result of of one homeowner, new homeowner who moved into the uh, in the Lake Forest, who, who who constructed a fence with fast dogs. Well, he had three dogs. He had, he had three dogs and he had a swimming pool, quite frankly. And he he uh, but he was not at the meeting. He didn't testify. We heard no counterbalance to probably five or six or seven or eight homeowners, which essentially espoused, David, your point of view and to some degree Kathy's. So the plan commission passed that with the amortization period and it had the like a, a 10 year clawback or whatever. Well, quite frankly, it was after that that we, 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 we got letters from the affected homeowner and we were told that he lived by every rule and regulation and, and every avenue that, that, that he was supposed to live through to, to construct this. And he met with Kathy. I think he even talked to, to affected homeowners. He, he, uh, he wasn't going to buy the property until he, because he had, because he wanted to put in a pool, because he had three dogs. He would not have done this had he, had he not, had he known that, um, that, that this was going to be taken away. Um, so he did it. He, 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 he spent, I don't know, I don't, require, I don't recall how much money. I'm going to say $40,000. Now, to tell him that he has to take that fence down after 10 years or to tell him that he has to forego that, that when he sells the property violates my sense of fair play. We're, we're not going to reimburse him for any of his expense. We're just going to unilaterally put in a restriction after he lived up to everything that he was supposed to do 
to, to do this. And, and I, I, I'll, I'll repeat myself, it, it violates my sense of fair play. And it is somewhat ironic, ironic to me that the last issue that came before me on the plan commission, uh, I aired. I, 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 I think we got to take that amortization period out of there, and I think we got to take that tenure or that that period in there that when if he sells his house because it just it violates it's it's not right it's not right if you don't want to compensate him for his financial loss and I don't think we're willing to do that so I think going forward it's it's like with every with anything else when you change the rules you grandfather those that are in but moving forward. Move forward, and with I a, think we're with, suggesting with, 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 a different, would, with, with a different, uh, with, you know, with a different mindset. While he lived there, he could have this fence. Would be one of the ideas. But when he go when he goes to when he goes to sell it, he's got a pool. So what? You're gonna, we're going to take the fence down. Well, couldn't you put up a fence that was in compliance? I mean, I think the whole point. The fence is, is in compliance. No, I mean, not with the new. No, ordinance. the new that complied with the new ordinance, which would be an open chain length type fence of dark green or no farther black. than 10 percent over the grade of the. You know, what, once, what, once again, you know, you can't change you, you when somebody lives up to the terms and conditions or the ordinances or the statutes or the whatever, in my estimation, to after he does all of that and, and, he, and he invests a substantial amount of money to go back and penalize him. Uh, is, is just is, this, is is the, this is the nature of city government is when when an ordinance fails to work because of some evidence in the future the ordinances are changed and it's changed because the community good is impacted negatively more than the individual good is impacted negatively and that's that's my argument for this is that it it provides one person with a bigger yard and it impacts ten people who have to look at it and those are the situations, just like one of my neighbors had, had a, uh, enough acreage to have two homes on his property. He combined them to save his real estate taxes. <clears throat> In the interim, you needed more land to divide your property. And when he went to sell his house, he didn't have enough for two lots. And he'd followed all the rules, but he wasn't able to come back and have his two lots. And that's because we had problems with density and flag lots and things like that. This is all of these ordinances have have collateral damage, and and we're only here to weigh which is worse. If we were if we were to say that, you know, not everything is grandfathered in. I I think it's 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 critical to say that these are difficult choices with collateral damage, but in this situation, I know I'm not I'm, I'm at least speaking for myself, that I think that the greater damage is being done to the community with this extraordinary fence that was that followed all the rules. I, I understand that. But it did things that other fences hadn't done before. People hadn't fenced opaquely to the bottom of the ravine. It was a it was a relatively new event. It, and it, it caused yeah. a heck of an impact to a ravine that a lot of people have familiar well, I, with. I have to pull back. There's a, a personal wish versus what I think is, a, again, a policy wish. And personally, um, I don't like the fence in the ravine. Um, if it was my property, I wouldn't construct the fence in the ravine. A lot of people will look at my house, my neighbors, and probably say, we don't like the Nova house. We wish it to change. Uh, but certainly, again, it's personal preference. And in this case, we have a property owner that played within the rules, uh, followed the ordinance which to the T. And I don't think as a council we could say uh, you should be penalized for following the rules strictly. We can move forward and restrict that because it's something we don't like. Uh, but it's going backwards, something we can do at this point. Uh, all the rules, it's something I like. Be complied. And I think we're um, invading his property interest as a private property owner in Lake Forest at this point by retroactively changing the rules. I don't want to see it going forward, but um, I beat as far as the current funds. I don't like it. I hope it falls in. I hope it's removed, but I think we have to let it stay. I would just like to clarify I don't want anything done retroactively, and I don't want to penalize the current homeowner. But, but when, they, when they sell the house. Well, but we're putting a limitation on and that limitation was in existence, so we are retroactively putting a limitation on the lifespan of the fence. I don't like it, 
but it's something again we can think forward on and maybe with planning in other areas where we cherish in the community think of other issues that can come up because this has been a learning lesson on that kind of period but why can't we put some limit some limit on the lifespan of and I hate, I, hate to, I hate to talk about keeping me back to this one fence because there might be other fences of similar nature. Can't we put some, are we, are we literally stuck with it forever? I mean, can't we put some limit on it? Can't we balance, you know, fairness to him and the greater good of the, of the community and of future generations of, of our community? Can't we, can't we find some some sort of balance between those two things? I, I, I think the, some... the idea of the amortization period is a fence doesn't last forever. And when you when you replace it, you ought to replace it with the kind of fence that we now allow. I think that's the spirit of the amortization thing. Maybe the period's too short. Uh, saying he has to do it when he sells his house is arbitrary. Mm-hmm. But we could, you know, obviously take information, well, what's the typical life of a fence and say, oh, that's the amortization period. And at that point, you're, you're going to have to replace your fence anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some fences may need to be replaced before or after. But if it doesn't have any period like that, then you can have that kind of fence forever. And I think uh, what David said is there ought to be a way to, over time, be fair to the people that have made the investment, but yet say, going forward, when it, t- it comes time to repair your fence or replace your fence, you have to have the kind of fence that we have. You still have more of your time than whatever's longer. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's fair. I, just, I, I mean, just if you want to live something. in your house for, you know, 90 years and your fence is falling down, we're not going to, well, I don't know. I, I think look at the fence more than the person because, you know, if the person is living there and he has to replace his fence, uh, we would have him replace his fence with the kind of fence we now allow. K- Kathy, doesn't the current ordinance provide for what... <clears throat> Uh, Alderman Palmer just said. If I understood Alderman Palmer, you're you're suggesting that there be some period of time, perhaps the normal lifespan of a fence, at the end of which the fence would need to be taken down. So it would be an amortization period that's right. something longer than ten years. Th- that's and, not what. That's not no, what. I, that's not what I heard. If, pardon uh, me for interrupting. Uh, what, what 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 I heard him say is, when when the I mean. A fence has a has a has a period of time. I don't think anybody here is smart enough to to know what that period of time is. But but the city is smart enough to know what that period of time is because it's kind of like I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, it's like the old pornography thing, is my recollection. Um, so, but that's what I thought I heard. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, I, but. What I was addressing was the idea behind an amortization period that it, it should somehow be calculated uh, based on the typical life of a fence. So no non-conforming fence could stay forever. We could put a further provision in that says any time the fence has to be replaced, it would be replaced with this. I mean, obviously, if somebody wants to, they can repair it piece by piece and say, no, I'm just repairing it. But the and concept that's, is... That's, that's the, norm the danger. In town. Yeah. 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 The, the concept is there's a cutoff point where you're going to have to replace the whole fence. Man, Jim, come in. Um, I do. Um, is there another example with with fences where, when properties um, change hands, that non-conforming fences are required to become conforming? For example, there are numerous rather large homes in Lake Forest that have installed stockade fences backwards, so that their neighbors get to look at the wrong side of the fence, and they keep these up. Some of them for literally forty years. I mean, they're falling down, they're in various states of disrepair. The homes have changed hands multiple times, and yet the fence stays the same. Um, I mean, is there an example where we've, we've brought, forced new homeowners to come into compliance or exiting homeowners to bring their home into compliance before they leave? If fences have been constructed with a permit, no, we currently do not have any provision that, uh, that would require fences to be removed or changed prior to the sale of property. Because I would think that if we were going to do this in this circumstance, we would apply that to all non-conforming fences. There was discussion at the plan commission that that there are some other aspects of the regulations pertaining to fences that need review. 
the focus of this ordinance was specifically to address <coughs> fences in ravines <coughs> and on bluffs. Uh, Kathy, what is your opinion on the language in there that gives you, that gives the city the authority <coughs> to, to deal with this issue in terms of replacement fences, fences in disrepair, et cetera? The language that's currently in the ordinance on page 177 um, it states that existing fences are allowed to remain in summary, so long as the fence is maintained in good repair and in an upright position. Repairs shall not include or permit excavation for the setting of new posts on the slope of a ravine or bluff. So someone could come in and rep repair the panels of a fence, if, if it's a paneled fence or the in individual pickets, but if repair required replacement of posts and new excavation, the new fence would be required to comply with this ordinance. Repairs could occur so long as they're within the scope of that language. Do fencing contractors, are they required to report to you every time they excavate for a new post? Technically, yes, a permit will be required. Because that doesn't happen currently. We know that activities occur without permits. Mike, did you have a comment? I do, I have a lot of comments. Mm. First of all, I, I watched your plan commission replay twice. You went to the 11 o'clock bell with that one. We did. Yeah. And it was very clear that the primary reason that came before you was the one specific fence situation, which I went out and looked at. And personally, I don't care for it, but Heinz makes 57 varieties. We all have different tastes. I don't feel any hardscape should be in a ravine. The ravines are too precious of a geological asset to this community. And, and I'm not just talking about the view of one neighbor into the other neighbor's ravine. They're delicate, fragile geological formations. And I don't think we should be putting any hardscape in a ravine that's potentially going to contribute to an acceleration of erosion or blocking a water course. And so I'm all for, I, we have to change the ordinance. I don't think any fences should be permitted down in the ravines. And that raises the issue, what do we do about the pre-existing ones, including the controversial one? And I agree with all of your comments. He went by the, the rules and he should not be penalized at all. There are situations where hardscape may be permitted in the ravine. Somebody wants to build a stairs to the ravine so they can get down to a footpath or if they want to put a bench for resting as they're walking down their property uh, to a footpath but the stairs and that kind of hardscape and Kathy correct me if I'm wrong all has to come before staff under our steep slope ordinance and pass muster and be properly engineered there's no Re practical reason that you could convince me of that you need a fence in the ravine because I don't think anybody's dogs and I have a dog and I've had multiple dogs needs their dog roaming down the ravine and potentially creating a, a footpath that <clears throat> redirects the water flow and contributes to uh, the diminishment of natural vegetation and the acceleration of erosion which hurts not only the immediate property, but na neighboring properties over the long term. So I, 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 personally, I'm not in favor of any new fences. Now, there is a provision for a variance for that, and it'll require very close scrutiny by staff in order to meet that standard for a variance. But I'm opposed to any new fences for all the reasons I've just discussed. Um, Relative to the existing fences, I, ha I do have some experience because we had three dogs when we moved to Lake Forest and Mr. Pearson put in a six foot tall stockade fence in my backyard and I faced the nice side out to all my neighbors. It lasted about 17, 18 years and then the posts wrapped. That's just the practical reality. So even if you can replace cedar panels, you've got to replace the posts. And if you do it according to Hoyle, you're pulling a permit from the city of Lake Forest. 
So I'm on my second stockade fence and I can already see its deterioration. So they do have a practical useful life of maybe 17, 18, if you're lucky, 20 years. But those, the posts are, gonna, are the weak link in the whole equation. So if we want to stretch and say the useful life of a fence is 20 years, then I'm willing to be generous and say, no more fences 30 years from now. Use a safety factor of 150% and say, all fences out of there 30 years from now, period, end of conversation. And that way, if, if the, the, the controversial fence that came up before the plan commission, if he sells in five years, he doesn't have to yank the fence out. But the world's on record notice that no more fences in our ravines unless they're permitted under a variance after 30 years, 25 years. I mean, give a cushion. But I like the amortization period because ultimately after I'm dead and gone, I think ideally we don't want any hardscape in the ravines. And that's just my personal opinion. I'm okay with something like that if it doesn't violate my sense of fair play. And quite frankly, this doesn't. So the idea being that we would structure the ordinance with the change reflecting putting back in some kind of a, a limitation and amortization period of some period of time for all fences, not just this one. But, yeah, I'm going to put four things. All the fences in the city, not all the fences that exist in the ravines are stockade fences. Yeah, and that's um, a good point because there could be stone and masonry fences down there. Or, well, it's it, chain link. But I'm not familiar with what that is. Well, it's chain link. Well, but those, the, the, the effect would be at the end of the amortization period, you could go in for a variance if you had a fence that was very insulting. <laughs> so you wouldn't have to tear it down. But if you had a fence that was not subject to the kind of qualities that a variance would allow, then you have to tear it down. So yeah, you could have a stone fence. Maybe the stone fence gets torn down because we don't want a stone fence. But if you have a chain link fence, at the end of the amortization period, you go in for a variance and they say, well, it isn't rusting, it's fine. Uh, we'll give you a variance at this point. I mean, we're, we're trying to fit a lot of different cases, and it seemed to me that the issue was really in setting an amortization period that would be logical and fair. And if you're going to have to replace a fence anyway at the end of 15 years, 20 years, make that the amortization period and end the discussion. It's, it's fair, I think. So. Okay. And another thing I'd like to add, too, is my whole concern focuses on the fragility of the ravine. It has nothing to do with one neighbor being privileged to view the other neighbor's backyard. If the controversial fence had been put up on the edge of the table so that he was creating visual privacy for his family in his backyard, and the people across the ravine had a look at a stockade fence, not down at the bottom of the ravine, but up in his backyard, I'm not opposed to that. A man's entitled to his privacy. And just, the ravine I'm concerned about. And, and I can live certainly with a longer amortization period, but 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 just out of curiosity, why is ten years not long enough? It's a really long time, and if they last a lot longer than that, to recoup their economic investment, I would suggest that um, Vic, unless there's something you'd like to add on this, it sounds from the discussion if an amortization period is desired that you would want to approve it as it was drafted, that is, sans the, the black lining, right. with two changes. One, that amortization period would be 20 years, if I'm hearing you all correctly, rather than 10. And two, we would not be reinserting Roman at three regarding termination upon transfer. Okay. And if a motion were made in that regard, we can have a conformed ordinance prepared consistent with whatever you might then approve. So moved. Second. Oh, can we, can we get I'm sorry. Yes, please come up. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't see you back there. Hi. My name is Devin Dallaire. I live at 261 Bluffs Edge. I'm the owner of the fence in question that I think um, stirred up a lot of this. Um, and I just want to say a few things. Um, the, the first thing is I actually think the version of the fence ordinance in front of you right now is a huge improvement over the version that you saw back in February. 
Um, I, I do think that we can sit around and discuss public policy and what's good and what's not. Um, but putting a retroactive provision in any ordinance is, in my opinion, it's just a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. And we can all sit around and debate how people don't like the looks of my fence, although I literally face two neighbors. I can see it over the ravine. But we can debate that all day. And But, but I think what's difficult not to debate is that what prevents this from becoming a garage? What be, why not the same criteria for a garage that violates a setback or a garage that is three cars instead of two? Or you built a house too close to the steep, steep slope uh, setback. There are houses all around me that, have viol that are in violation of every ordinance that has come about in the last 20 years. Too close to the bluff, too close to the ravine, not enough setback. Yet, when they sell their home, there's no requirement for them to bring it back into compliance. There's no requirement for a garage owner to tear down half of his garage so that he's in compliance. But somehow, it seems fair to apply it to the fence. And as, as you mentioned, I, I followed every rule. I didn't do it under some guise of like trying to figure out how can I void the system and where's the loophole. No, we went down. We hired a contractor. We hired several. We talked to several fencing companies and asked them what's allowed, what's not, what's what have you done before, what's what's you know, okay, what's not okay. Um, are there engineering requirements? Do we have to make sure that we don't impede drainage? Do we have to make sure that we don't damage vegetation? We did all that. And we followed all the rules. And the investment was in excess of $40,000. But not only that, but as um, uh, uh, Alderman mentioned, we would never have purchased this property. And I tell you that in all sincerity. We looked at at least half a dozen properties in Lake Forest that had four acre lots that were beautiful properties that I would have loved to live in. And this property was the one that I said, and I remember saying it to the realtor, the seller, seller's agent saying, is this going to be difficult to contain? Because if it's going to be difficult to contain, I have three dogs. We're going to have a pool. Secure, not security, but just sense of privacy, making sure that people are, I mean, and whether it's the safest town or not, the, the reality is it's a sense of privacy that I think we all like and enjoy. For all those reasons, I like to have some containment. For all those reasons, coyotes invading our property, coyotes jumping you know, uh, a, a five foot chain link fence all the time. I mean, it's just there's there's a myriad reasons why we did this. It wasn't just out of, ah, it's my land. I want to fence it. It was because there were just practical things that had to be accomplished. For instance, we have a pool. If we can't fence down in the ravine a little bit, then what we're faced with is basically putting a fence on table. Well, I mean, what does that do? That essentially impedes my view of the lake. Well, without that view of the lake, I guarantee you I would not have purchased that property, or at least I wouldn't have spent what I spent on it. On top of that, when we chose to build this, after we looked at the ordinances, we talked to people, we talked to contractors. Finally, after everyone, after doing a careful evaluation, came to us and said, you can fence the property. There's no reason you have to follow rules. There's a permit process, et cetera. But once you do it, you're, you're okay. It's, it's, it's perfectly allowable. Now, did I know that every single neighbor was going to be up in arms about it? I absolutely did not. I absolutely not. One neighbor came and spoke to my wife prior to the fence being erected. And that was when the posts of the day the posts were being put in. Since that day, not one single neighbor has come to me and talked to me about this. Not one single neighbor came and spoke to me prior. So nobody came to me and said, this is not a good idea. This is something you really should avoid. Nobody said this. Trust me, had anyone said this, I would have picked one of the five other properties that we looked at and we would have moved on. I don't like conflict. I don't like spending my evenings at planning commissions or city councils. Prior to coming to Lake Forest, I've never once been in a city council meeting, plan commission meeting, or had any sort of run-in with a regulatory body. Never. And this is, I, I can't tell you the amount of frustration and just effort and energy I've expended on this after following what were the rules. And so we sit here and we talk about things such as it's a resource, it's a community resource, these ravines. Now, I understand Representative Alderman's, uh, Adelman's point that uh, ravines are fragile ec ecological um, structures and that we have to be very wary of them. And there are ways to deal with that. There's engineering that you can do before you build anything. You can actually make sure that it's constructed properly. You can make sure that you're not damaging things. You're not ripping up all the vegetation. There's all sorts of ways that you can control that. But just simply saying that you can't, that you must take these structures out, in my opinion, is actually doing more damage. You're going to actually have to go in and take these structures out. And now you basically have holes in the ground. 
and they are going to what have to be filled in, are going to erode, etc. In in addition, I just want to touch on another point: this whole thing about public versus private good. This argument that we can retroactively take down my fence because it does more public good than it does private harm. In my opinion, it's an incredibly dangerous standard by which to set public policy. Incredibly dangerous. And if you don't believe so, then why not just take my entire property and turn it into a public beach? Take my entire backyard and turn it into a public beach for all of the courts. Huge public good. I'm sure people would appreciate it very much. It would have a big cost on me, a big impact on me. But balancing public good with private good is not the right measure. It's did I abide by the law? Did I do what was what I was supposed to at the time that I built it? Um, and then finally, as far as people looking into the ravine, I, I said this before and I'll say it again. It is private property. There is an easement for my specific neighbors for 20 homes that live on my street and one street down. Um, yet this path and this piece of land that I purchased is trespassed day and night, day and night, by not only kids in Lake Forest, who we talked about a drinking problem. If you have a, you know, if you debate that, come to my property on a Friday night. And you'll see bonfires going. You'll see kids down there drinking. You'll see kids doing drugs down there. This is my property. This is my backyard. This is my backyard. How, I mean, how would anybody in this room or anyone feel if someone came to you and pitched a tent in your backyard and started a bonfire? This is what happens on my property. Eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, I'm sitting outside with my wife in my backyard, and I hear people going along the side of my yard, going to the back. How would that make you feel? How would that make you feel? I've had people literally last week walk onto my property on my front yard. They tried to go down the ravine, got cut off by the fence, came back up my front yard. I mean, you know, we say things like community resource, natural resource. These are things that roll off our tongue pretty easily. But then we start believing it. And once you start believing it, we really start thinking we're entitled to each other's property. And I think I'm entitled to use your land. And I'm entitled to go ahead and, you know, occupy your property. This is silly. Mr. Dale, uh, if you don't mind, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your comments and appreciate your opinions. Any other further discussion from the council? I, I would just like to clarify that I don't think anything we mentioned tonight would make him take his fence down. He just couldn't rebuild it after its useful life. Right? There's no retroactive takedown or anything like that. So. The, the motion as it's on the table right now is, as in the packet with the two changes, one that the language regarding amortization would be reinstalled and the other provisions taken out as 20 years rather than 10, and there would not be the due on or the removal on sale. So that that's the current pending motion. It has been seconded. Mike, can you discuss it at all before? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's time for discussion. Is there another mechanism we can come up that's in the spirit of amortization, but triggered by some other event? Is it can we really come up with something else that will ultimately bring an end to the fences down in the ravine and yet not be offensive to a homeowner like this who's invested a substantial amount of money? Could we say 20 years or as long as the resident who's living there now lives there? If somebody lived there for 40 years, they could have a fence for 40 years? Whichever's longer. Yeah. May I offer a suggestion? Is that possible? Just, just as a matter of both policy and law, Illinois courts have said in the past that zoning relates to uses and property, not to ownership. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am concerned that having a provision that is tied simply to ownership uh, may run afoul of existing uh, zoning law in Illinois. So that that's something that from a legal perspective I think would be a difficult thing to do. I, I think you also have some practical problems that could arise if somebody wishes to change from a, a joint tenancy to a single mm -hmm. tenancy or a land trust. That raises questions as to has that actually had a material change in ownership. If we avoid those questions by not 
entering into the field of ownership, I think will be better served in the long run. So stick to a time frame is what you're saying. Right. Well, what and I just, oh, I'm sorry. What if you had a high number? Let's say the number wasn't 20. Let's say the number was 30, which is generous. It allows an extra 10 years beyond what I think is a reasonable life expectancy of wood investment. And you said the Fed's got to come back either at the later of the amortization period or the ownership by existing homeowners and grandfathered fences. So you look at whoever owns these properties with the fences, they're grandfathered until the later of the Nick just said that wouldn't. When they sell. Nick, he just said that wouldn't. No, no, not when they sell. When, uh, when, when they come down, when they come down of their own weight. No, I was going to say the later in the amortization period. Or when they sell, so they no. sold in 10 years. He said years. ownership won't work in the law. Ownership won't work, Mike. But it's a combination. No. Look, look you know, again, gen I, generally, zoning is not based on ownership, and I think that's something that we would be well served to, to follow that. Is it, can grandfathering be based on ownership? Um, there, there are some uh, due-on-sale provisions, if you will, on, on, uh, on zoning. I, I think... We would have to be much more specific as to what constitutes a, a transfer of ownership um, and identify some of the uh, some of the different transfers that could occur that may or may not be intended to be a trigger for that. I think it's important to add to the record that this is not a unique situation to the City of Lake Forest. When the City of Lake Forest passed its comprehensive sign ordinance, there were a number of signs that were in violation. They were determined to be non-compliant signs and they gave them an amortization. I think in that case, Kathy can correct me, I think it was 10 years. And again, it was tied back to what we thought the useful life of the signs were. So over a period of 10 plus years, they all got changed out and came into compliance with uh, city code. Um, to uh, follow up on the gentleman's comment, in effect, we did the same thing when we rezoned the east side of Lake Forest. And yes, we didn't go through and wholesale change people's homes, but the reality was if anybody wanted to build a new home, put an addition on, do any of these kinds of things, there was a variant process in the procedures that they could follow. Same with steep slope setback. Just same like with steep fence slope setback. There's yeah. more, uh, a number of examples in town where we Bulk have ordinance. done just this. Yeah. I think the issue becomes more of what is that appropriate amortization period or, or fair amortization period that we feel is both fair and equitable to the owner of the property who did do everything in compliance with the codes that were in place at the time, but recognizing that I think that this is a situation where once we see it, we say we don't like that situation and we're going to change the code and eventually we'll bring that into compliance. There is a possibility that 20 years from now the owner of that property could say, you know what, I really would like to put a stockade fence up again. There's a variance process they can come in, seek a hardship, and get approval for it. I think that determination will be made at the time that the fence or the owner at that time is looking to do something with the fence once it reaches its useful life. When, when does the amortization period actually start from the date of construction or issuance of permit or from, start the, of from the ordinance? Start from the effective date of the ordinance. Okay. So that's not retro, retroactive. Yeah. Right. No, it would be 20 I, years hence. To, to, to me, 20 years is too short. It's too close to the 17 years we were talking about before, the 18 years. To tell you the truth, I don't like amortization periods at all because, again, I think it violates some – it violates my sense of – fair play if you're not going to reimburse them for the financial potential financial loss so I but I will vote for it if we do Mike's 30 if, uh, let me give an example of that let's say in the instant case we've got Mr. Miller here who not only invested a substantial amount of money in his fence but wouldn't have otherwise invested substantially more in the house and acquired so we can have Let's say 30 year amortization. But Mr. Galera sells his house in 10 years. He's gone, he's not a vendor anymore. And 30 years from now, that fence has to be gone. On the other hand, if he owns the house for the next 40 years, at the end of 30 years, 
You can come back to who's ever sitting here and say, I'd like a variance. Remember me, I'm the guy who did everything by the rule book, and I'm caught in the switch of your legislation. And I would say a reasonable and fair-minded board would grant him his variance. He's not going to live forever. None of us are. So in an effort to move this forward, I'd say I propose a 30-year amortization with the variance procedure, and that way we've covered... Unless you think the 30 years doesn't work for the people with the stone fences and the wrought iron fences. Can I ask a couple That's of clarification questions if this is the <clears> – I think 25 is 10 years past the life of a fence. But a clarification question. So in five years, somebody wants to repair a fence that's 15 years old in the ravine, and they repair it. What, what would be the – can they? Yes, based but on But not that. put a post in the ground unless Correct. they move it up the hill to the new, to where the new ordinance would lie had we voted on it tonight or if we were done voting. They on could it. repair the fence in its present location based on the language that's in the code. They or could not install new posts. They could not. They can repair the new panels, holes, wire it together, because we've seen Lake Forest fence repairs. There are homeowners pounding stakes in the ground and wiring their fences together so they don't have to, I mean, it's all over. But, so they can't put a new post in the ground to repair their fence. Four years from now, if their fence is 12 years old and it's, it's, it's 16 years, it's beginning to fall apart. Once we pass this ordinance, you couldn't put a new post in the ground below the new limit. That is correct. Right. So unless you did it without a permit, then your neighbors would call and say they did this without a permit, and there would be some enforcement issue, and then you'd have another good week. You know, just in the interest of trying to bring some closure to this, I, I'd like to ask for a motion. We've talked about different times. I think generally speaking, the council probably feels like some, perhaps with one or two exceptions, for her, feels like there is some agreement on some type of an amortization period that is fair and reasonable and to mike's point uh, which allows the homeowner to at the end of that time come back in for a variance if they still own the property um, so what i might suggest is someone i would propose uh, an, a motion with some chosen level of an amortization period uh, that the council can consider mr mayor we do actually have a motion on the table for 20 years uh along that line that was moved by alderman moore and seconded by alderman palmer i missed that part but just another comment the microphone is really today and for whatever it's reverbing but as far as fences we're looking at what's in front of us and uh the offending fence is of course the focus of everyone's here do we have an inventory of fences that are in ravines in this town? Are, are there public fences in ravines? Uh, yeah, again, we're kind of shooting and focusing on one fence, but you know, as we sit here as a board, we don't even know what effect this is going to have. We're kind of arbitrarily uh, reeling off uh, with not much knowledge what we think should be active amortizations. Uh, yeah, but not, before Kathy attempts to answer that, let me just tell you. I wondered about that, too, and at one time suggested, let's get an inventory of all the fences. Oh. But we don't need that. We don't need that because if we enact this ordinance with an agreed-upon amortization, there's going to be a mechanism to deal with every fence, whether there's 102 of them out there or 75 or 300. We've, <coughs> we're going to have the variance uh, provision in this to deal with each and every fence. But we can go ahead right now and restrict further construction of any new offenses. And that will uh, stop any further harm. And at a later date, we could come back and come back and re-examine this, possibly when we have a little more knowledge. But again, we're kind of shooting from the hip here without much knowledge. And I love ravines. I want to see probably a little more restoration than just a knee-jerk reaction uh, versus a, a fence that was constructed. I think that as a city, we'd want to have a little more expansive code to protect the ravines. And maybe this is an opportunity to examine it, move ahead on something a little wider. Uh, and again, we have an opportunity to stop any further construction, but don't we want a little bit more here? Don't we want to study it? Don't we want to do it right? We've had this in front of us twice already. But we're talking about fences, and again, 
the amortization and the claims commission flip flopped on uh, a few times, but. Again, maybe there's other things that are constructed in the ravines that we'd want out also. Uh, there might be other elements. There might be paths that should be constructed in certain manners with certain materials. Maybe we should be a little more sensitive as a whole towards what's constructed in ravines. Maybe it's just not fences. Uh, but again, we could restrict it now, study it, move forward uh, for removal of other items. I, I just think we're kind of going in. 40 different directions without much knowledge. Ken, I would suggest to you that it, good, those are all good comments, and, and I think it's worthwhile continuing to look at everything you've talked about. I think I, my sense is that this is a specific topic we're going to try to tackle with, tackle tonight, that has gone through the Planning Commission a couple times, has been reviewed by staff, and I, I don't think that limits us at all from continuing to look at other pieces of the ravines, uh, as you said you know, stairs, steps, paths, whatever it may be, and I think it gives us a bigger picture, but I think this is a particular item that we might want to either take up or down this evening. Well, this is a fence ordinance. And right. The other elements, the stairs, That's right. other hardscape, Kathy can tell you, we've got the steep slope setback ordinance. Oh. I mean, we've got statutes on the book to deal Good with stuff. So can I change my motion to 25 years? So long as Alderman Palmer uh, accepts the I, I amendment. I accept the amendment. Okay. And it's, the, the motion is span, as, as pending is for 25 years amortization. So we have a motion for 25 year amortization with a second. And I'm going to call for a vote. Roll call vote, please. Thank you. Can Mike. I make another comment? And that Last is, one. I would really love to see it 30 instead of 25. This is not a short term solution. This is a long term solution. We're trying to be fair to everybody. We're all not going to be here 25 years from now. Well, I won't be. You won't be. But in all seriousness, so what's You're another okay. five I've years? High hopes. Another five years, nobody's going to arm wrestle with us and say, oh, I spent all this money on a fence. Sure, it would have lasted 30 years. Come on. Fences last about 20 years, give or take. So if we put the 30-year buffer in there, we're looking out for the long-term welfare of the community, not a short-term solution. Alderman Moore, would you like to change your motion? Pretty please. I think it's a 15-year life, and I think going to 25 years is plenty for a wooden stake in the ground. I told you I had one for 17, 18 years. Okay, and we have given them 25. We do have a motion that has been seconded with the amortization at 25 years. Biddy, would you do a roll call vote, please? It's not included. Yes. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Nay. Alderman Palmer? <coughs> Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. <laughs> so six yay, one nay, motion carries. Thank you, Betty. Thank you very much for your discussion. Thank you, Mr. Dillar, for coming this evening. Uh, next item on the agenda, new business. Any new business to come before the council? Uh, Item, additional item, uh, other items for council discussion? Any alderman care to? Oh. Yes. Uh, I had uh, our Native Plants Community Engagement Forum last Thursday. I was overwhelmed at how well it went. And I wish you guys could have been there. I have four outstanding speakers who I would like to personally thank once again. John Santel from Lake Forest Open Lands. John Mariani from Mariani Landscaping, uh, Trisha Beck, Beck Jord from Midwest Ground Covers, and finally Nathan Aberg from Conserve Lake County. The wealth of information that was presented was mind boggling and really enlightening, and the people who attended really enjoyed it, and I've gotten some good feedback. My only regret is that I didn't think ahead of time to have somebody videotape it from staff <coughs> so it could run on Channel 17 because I think it would far and away attract uh, a viewing audience that otherwise would be watching BRB meetings and historic preservation and all that. And I wish I could put these four people together again and take them on the road. They were just tremendous. So I thank them all, and a special thanks to Mary Van Arsdale who I uh, couldn't put this together without. 
Great. Mike, thanks. We've had some very uh, productive community forums, and I think the intent of the forum was just to get input, not necessarily, I hear what you're saying about recording, but just to begin to engage and get dialogue. Um, and so thank you for doing that. We've got more coming up, and if I remember right, Thursday evening, uh, 7 to 8.30 at Gorton is the Ward 1 meeting where Alderman Novit and Alderman Waldeck will will be there. So uh, Ward 1 residents are certainly welcome to attend that as well. Anything else from the council? I'd just like to point out that in October, we will have a similar meeting uh, concerning Ravine. So if you all are still interested, <laughs> uh, come back and we'll talk more about the, the whole gamut of uh, this topic. A slippery slope. Oh. Oh. Don't count on me. <laughs> With that, I look for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We are adjourned.